with a city as incredible as this. I mean, come on, look at that skyline. Can you blame outsiders for thinking Torontonians are a bit conceited from time to time? But honestly, you don't have to live outside Toronto to hate it sometimes, too. I mean, is that pigeon eating vomit? And I love this city a lot, but it is time to have a conversation about what is working and what is not. The TTC is called The Better Way because apparently we're hilariously sarcastic here. Crowded, slow, or tragically behind schedule, yeah, there's got to be a better way. It's called biking, but that sucks sometimes too. How about when you see bikers weaving in and out of traffic, but when you see jams like this, can you blame them? But for many, the bike infrastructure in this city is just not good enough. And even when it does work, it ends up driving the car-loving half of this city mad, infringing on vital parking real estate. Because, oh yeah, parking is basically real estate now, with spots in the downtown going for hundreds of dollars a month, if you can find them. And in some new builds, spots can cost over $100,000 to buy. Driving is another real nightmare. Rush hour here starts at 3 p.m. and seems to last until there have been too many breakdowns on the gardener to even count. Those breakdowns may also be about the fact that you're driving on a road that is literally crumbling beneath you. But I digress, traffic. Main drags clogged with a construction season that feels like it lasts every single day of the calendar. While garbage feels like it's picked up none of the days of the calendar, overflowing bins, a real eyesore, and a stank fest. And I swear they disappear all together when you need them most. Meanwhile, the city's homelessness problem never disappears, yet so often is ignored. Unless people take over a popular park, then the unhoused become public enemy number one. And hey, you'd think we'd all have more general compassion because in a city where a $100,000 income still limits your chances of scoring a home, you have all been set up to fail. And if you need the help of the police, I don't blame you if you have doubts before calling 911. Toronto police admitting an uncomfortable truth last year. In particular, black people are more likely to have force used against them. To be fair, Toronto has so many perks, big attractions, cool restaurants, world-class concerts, really nice neighborhoods. Too bad you can't afford any of that. Sure, all the green around town will no doubt make you feel happier. And I'm not talking about the pot shops along Queen. The epic hiking trails and big city parks are real buttes to write home about. Unless you're in the downtown and then searching for green space is exhausting and will make your dog cross its legs. But as we gather this election night to take stock of our love-hate relationship with Toronto, maybe a tenth thing to hate about our city is the number one most frustrating, the simple and unshakable fact that even with all these big city problems, we don't hate Toronto. We don't hate Toronto at all. What a great way to kick off this night. Thank you so much to our live studio audience joining us right here at the CBC Broadcast Centre in downtown Toronto. And thank you, everybody, joining us on CBC Gem or on our YouTube page. Did you like that opener, everyone? Well, local musician Blue Will, along with a couple of local music producers, actually provided two of the tracks for it. And I also want to give a big shout out to our beautiful city, just for looking so good in so many of those opening shots, even as we beat up on it just a little bit. It is, of course, election night in Toronto and across Ontario. I am Chris Glover, so happy to be here with you tonight. And our team will be dissecting some of the biggest problems with this city, the things that keep you up at night. And no, I'm not talking about construction out your window at 3 a.m. We are here to talk about solutions tonight. How can we build a better city that will not have people sprinting for the exit? And you better believe we will have all of your real-time election results covered for you. We have reporters fanned out in Toronto and across the GTA. We'll check in with them throughout 
the next hour. Plus, we have several special guests with specific interests in our city, from transit to planning to housing. They will join me throughout the show to help us think about how things could be improved in Toronto. But before we dig into those conversations, results are always important on an election night, even when some have criticized Toronto's mayoral race as uncompetitive or snoozy at time this time around, with seven incumbent councillors not running in this election, plus the tragic death just last week of another. There are several open races to watch, and now I want to bring in my friend Farah Morelli. You are going to be tracking all the results tonight. Set things up for us. What are you going to be watching for? Chris, all things numbers. Uh, we know that in less than 10 minutes, the polls are going to close, and some of those pre preliminary results are going to start coming in very quickly. I'm going to be going through the tallies and bringing you what you need to know when it comes to results tonight. Now, speaking of numbers, let's take a second and talk about voter turnout. Four years ago, voter turnout wasn't great. And when I say wasn't great, I mean a record low. Just 38% of Ontarians cast a ballot in the municipal elections. So when you look at the numbers for Toronto, not much higher at 41%. We won't likely get those until later today or tomorrow, but what I can tell you is that tonight is shaping up to be interesting for a few reasons. One of the big reasons is what you talked about, Chris, the fact that there are so many incumbents not running in, in so many wards. These are races that are up for grads and have the have the potential to change the face of City Council. So I'll be watching those very closely tonight. But I should mention, we're not just looking at races in Toronto. We are also looking at other races in the GTA, particularly the mayoral races in Brampton, Mississauga, Hamilton. One of the races I'm going to be really interested in is in Vaughan, where you have a three-term mayor not running this year and is throwing his support behind the former leader of the Ontario Liberals. Uh, it's going to be an interesting race to watch. I should add, we are hearing tonight that there have been some issues at polling stations in Vaughan, uh, and for that reason, a few dozen of them are going to be staying open until 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock, so those results may be delayed. But of course, Chris, the big race that many people are anxious to watch tonight is who will be the mayor of Toronto for the next four years. We will be bringing you the results as they come in. Hey, Farah, thanks for doing all the uh, heavy lifting there, my friend, with the results. It's not an easy task, but thank you for that. And of course, polls close in just eight minutes from now. And when they do, those results are going to be flying in fast and furious. And CBC Toronto's municipal affairs reporter, Sean Jeffords, is going to be here with us throughout the night on and off. You're going to be watching those results very closely. I should add that Sean is a new pickup for us at CBC Toronto. And we are so grateful that you came just in time for this campaign. You've done a fantastic job. Thanks, Chris. So it's first of all, let's start with the mayoral race. What are you going to be watching for with that? You know, Mayor Tory's run a pretty classic front runners campaign. He's really stressing that he's the experienced person to have his hand on the wheel for the next four years, you know, pitching that he's the guy to get transit built and to fill this budget gap, which is pretty big right now. But on the other side of it, you've got his main challenger, Gil Penalosa, the urbanist, who's basically saying, you know, the status quo is not good enough, challenging Tory on that. Whether he's had enough time to gain enough traction, we'll have to see. Some people have accused the mayoral race in Toronto of being a bit snoozy this time around, not as competitive as it has been in past years. That is not the case when you drill down and look at the ward races, especially with all of the open wards at play. Tell us which ones you're going to be paying the most attention to. Oh, definitely a bunch. We'll watch all of them. But in particular, I'm watching Spadina Fort York, where you've got 12 people vying to replace outgoing councillor Joe Cressy. Uh, you know, we've also got uh, Etobicoke North, where 16 people are on the ticket there. There's a no forward on the ballot for the first time in over 20 years. So that's one to watch. Mm -hmm. We've also got... Uh, University of Rosedale, where the former environmental commissioner for the province, Diane Sachs, is running against Norm De Pasquale, a former school board trustee, and uh, Robin Buxton Potts, an interim councillor for the city. Okay, and it's not just open wards that I know you're paying attention to. There's a couple of incumbent races that I know could be maybe close tonight. We'll have to see which are those that you're paying the most attention to. So Etobicoke Lakeshore is pretty interesting. You've got uh, Amber Morley running against incumbent Mark Grimes. We want to keep an eye on that one. Um, also York Southwestern, where Francis Nunziata, a key ally of the mayor, is facing a challenger from Kiara Pen uh, Pen Padab Pund Padavi. Excuse me. Um, and also we've got um, Gary Crawford out in Scarborough Southwest. He's facing a real challenge there.
you can be forgiven for that. There are so many names to have to remember when you're looking at all Paddles these Vandy. award races. Excuse me. Yes. It's, a, it's a lot to cover. Yeah. Another thing that I know that you're going to be looking at is the makeup of the mayor and council when they go back because they're going to have a bit of a curveball here from the provincial government in the form of those strong mayor powers that Toronto and Ottawa are going to be getting. Tell us, how do you think that's going to impact the dynamics at City Hall? Well, there are definitely things we know about it. We know the powers give the mayor some sweeping authority over the budget. We, it gives him a veto over certain uh, legislation that's a priority of the province, but it, it also gives him the power to hire and fire some senior civil, civil servants. What we don't know yet, Chris, is how he will use the powers. He's right. basically said he's going to try to not. He'll, he'll try to build coalitions like he has over the past eight years. We're going to have to wait and see. And he certainly won almost all of the uh, important votes in the last council anyway. So right. we will be watching that very closely, of course. Sean, thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. All right. Thank you to Sean Jeffords, our municipal affairs reporter. And certainly it will be a busy night for Sean. And whoever takes over control of this city and its wards, they are going to be busy as well. There are more than a few problems. Many of them I highlighted in that opening piece there from ending gridlock to endless construction to addressing housing and affordability. Does it seem like anyone even has a plan for Toronto sometimes? If you were an urban planner, what would you do with the city? We took those questions to the streets to get your ideas. If you were an urban planner, what's the number one thing you would change about Toronto? Um, affordable housing, definitely. And uh, I would definitely provide more resource centers, even 24-hour resource centers for the homeless. Not construct every, every street at the same time. <laughs> at the exact same time, it's all over the place. I would make more outdoor movement spots for people, like places okay. for people to go and do like their classes outside, like the fitness people, uh -huh. yoga people and stuff like that. Maybe more spots for movement, uh -huh. yeah. You got to work on the housing. Like we can't have the housing and the mental health crisis. It's, it's an addiction, it's all in one. But once people are housed, then you can support them in their house. Um, if they don't have a house, it's a basic need. Housing is a right. So without housing, like winter's coming, like we got to take care of our own. Such a great point there and so many great points, really. The sky is the limit when it comes to urban planning in Toronto. And of course, I mean that literally. There are so many skyscrapers going up around us. But is there a smarter way for us to build this city while also making it easier or maybe just downright possible to still get around? Nama Blonder is an architect and urban planner with Smart Density. And Alexandra Lambropoulos is getting her master's in urban planning and is the host of the podcast, Urban Limitrophe. Thank you both of you for being here with me tonight. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, so Nama, I want to start with you because we just heard from a lot of those uh, people around town who were talking about the thing that drove them the craziest about planning in the city of Toronto. You probably heard there how many times people referenced housing. And so as the co-founder of Smart Density, I'm curious from you, what's one idea that you have that could actually improve housing in Toronto? Smart Density, and that means, you know, building next to transit, mm -hmm. building dense, not necessarily hyper tall, but definitely dense. And that brings us to the, you know, 15 minute neighborhood concept. Right. Everything is within Pushed a by Gil Penalosa in this, uh, in this campaign. It's, it's an, he it didn't invent it. It's a right. very common, uh, you know, professional term to use when we try to explain to communities what it, actually means to have a mixed use, that everything is walkable, that you can reach your daily needs. Your daily needs are met within 15 minutes of walking from where you live. So that, that to me, it sounds like a, a good summary. Okay, good start. Alexandra, I want to turn over to you. We've talked a lot about housing affordability. That's certainly something that several of those people talked about. A lot of times when we do so, we think of affordable housing, kind of straight up subsidized housing by the government. But what we're finding from so many people is just renting and buying generally is so tough right now in the city. I'm curious, do you have one idea that might actually make it a bit cheaper for folks to rent and to buy in the city of Toronto? Yeah, I mean... A lot of the work that I do um, is looking at uh, the idea of like creative mixed use. Mm -hmm. And that means looking at buildings and very similar to what Nama was talking about, like smart density and how do you leverage already the, the, the real estate that we have, the buildings that we have to not just 
uh, build single uses, but mixing, mixing a number of different uh, public amenities, but also um, affordable housing amongst a number of other like public amenities that help to make our cities um, and housing ultimately more affordable, but also really like a lot more livable by creating these like public spaces that um, enable people to like build community in a number of different things. So yeah. There were a lot of times also during this campaign that I heard the term the missing middle, mm -hmm. and that is a problem in the city of Toronto. It's a problem in a lot of cities. Nama, I'm curious from you, why is the missing middle such a problem in Toronto, and what's one thing that could be done to, to help that? Already being done. So Toronto, you look at it from the air, the last time you, know, you landed maybe from an airplane, the vast majority of the city is zone single family. All you could do. Mm -hmm. is to buy a home or a house and build another house. You are not allowed to have more than one family living on that lot. On the other hand, you look right and you see those hyper-density nodes. So the missing middle reflects to, you know, the type of housing that could be between the single family and the tall buildings. But the missing middle is also, you know, miss, missing the middle of, uh, of income, of mm -hmm. communities, of demographics. And, uh, and that is something that Toronto, like many other North American cities, has been challenged with. Uh, but there's a discussion. The city has worked really hard in the last three years about changing that policy. Okay, and I uh, just am looking at the clock here. The polls have now closed, so those results will be coming in fast and furious, but I want to keep continuing on with this conversation. And uh, Alexandra, over to you. Kind of the same question, because we've been hearing so many things mm -hmm. about the missing middle. Penaloso was talking about allowing people to kind of age in place, having people subdivide their homes. We heard another conversation about legalizing rooming houses, adding more duplexes, triplexes. What's, what do you think? What would be a good solution to this missing middle? I think the interesting part about the missing middle and this concept is really providing, it's really about providing flexibility for allowing people to live uh, like a lifestyle that might be more like uh, amenable to the, the, the current layout, to, to the, the type of life that they're trying to live. And you mentioned already a few options there, like uh, aging in place, but it's also looking at maybe having multi-generational families in one space. Like Toronto is a place where there's a number of newcomers mm -hmm. all coming from around the world, all used to different kind of living styles. And the way that we currently have our housing uh, set up doesn't allow for these different types of community or different ways of living to currently operate. So the missing middle really does provide um, a, like a gateway to allow that to happen. Well, and oftentimes when there is a change in the city, there's objections from residents. I, I want to point <laughs> out one just recently, Garden Suites this year, they were allowed to have that second building, that second dwelling just behind the house in the backyard. Mm -hmm. So nice if you have a backyard, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. That's quite a privilege right now <laughs> in the city of Toronto. <laughs> but uh, Nama, I'm curious from you, when you hear about a policy like that, that, fears, that faced fierce opposition from residents. They tried to object to it, held it up for a while. Ultimately, it's gone forward. But how is that kind of an example of the roadblocks that are being dealt with in this city? It's really interesting because, you know, when that policy came up, I said, wow, that, it's not going to solve the affordability crisis. Like, you, you're not going to solve it one by one. And then there was the appeal by, another, you know, other NIMBYs as groups across the city. And I thought, you know, I thought that was the most harmless policy on earth. That's why I actually criticized it, because like it was so easy. And then you see those groups objecting it. And I'm saying like, if we're objecting, if we are even having those discussions at this point, mm -hmm. what's going to happen when we really need to, you know, solve the affordability crisis with something that actually moves the needle? Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I, resident objections are one thing. I'll take that point for sure. We hear about it a lot. The other thing that we do hear about is red tape and bureaucracy at City Hall. So on that side of the equation, Alexandra, when you're looking at the ways that things function mm -hmm. at City Hall, is there a way to kind of clean up that red tape that you can think of? I think one way of doing that is um, from like my different like interviews that I've done on the podcast, talking with community groups, I kind of ask a similar question to them. And my panelists trying to, um, my guests trying to ask them like, if you're in front of like city council or if you're in front of, um, or like what kind of policies or, um, uh, or programs would you need in order to like escalate your work and elevate it and, and have more of an impact across your city. And so um, I think that's really it. A city council really has to listen to what these different community organizations or community groups are doing I found that a lot of the solutions that we have are already like rooted, um, already found by these different community groups ad addressing these issues. So 
I think that's a good start. Okay. Nama, I'm curious. One of the things that drives me the craziest is the gridlock and the congestion that we have to deal with in this city, no matter if you're on a streetcar or in a car. A lot of people are probably going to relate to the fact that they're getting stuck. And many cases, I'm thinking about Adelaide right now, shut down for months. You don't have to look that far to Eglinton to see what they've had to deal with. And then St. Clair before that, all of those projects were big transit projects, which a lot of people generally around town seem to be on board with. But what I guess I'm curious about is how could the city be doing city building and getting that growth that we need while also allowing the city to be livable at the same time? You, you just said that car or streetcar doesn't matter. So it does matter. It matters a lot. And the sustainable future we all want to walk towards is really deprioritizing the car and prior putting pedestrian first, transit, you know, th this is the type of uh, urban planning that, that it's very clear to, to professionals. And now the question is how we get everyone on board. But, you know, the discussion around car, you mentioned real estate for parking. Mm -hmm. It's a really important discussion to have because we need to put the car and the use of car in, in place. So creating, investing in transit, everyone here should be super happy that it's, it's happening. We're, we're talking about the relief line, now the Ontario line for 40 years. It's finally, you know, has its budget, c construction started. These are exciting times, so everyone should be. I know it's annoying in 8 a.m., but we live in exciting times. All right, sounds good. Uh, we just have one minute left, so I want to hear from both of you. Let's end on a positive note. Is there one thing that Toronto is nailing that the six should be uh, on a platform that other people are looking at in terms of trying to replicate that? Alexandra, we'll start with you. I'll start, uh, I think, definitely public art. I used to work in a public arts organization and there's community groups out there doing some amazing things, trying to like add a bits of vibrancy across the city in unexpected ways. And so, yeah, I'd say public art. Love it. Nama, how about My for you? My first answer would be food. We're <laughs> doing food really well. Uh, but our open space, public realm, playgrounds, I have two young kids. We are nailing it. Okay, great. Well, hey, a little optimism, a bit upbeat. Nice to end there. Thank you so much, Nama and uh, Alexandra, for joining us tonight. Thank, Thank you. All right, so we know that John Tory. Yes, a little applause here from the live studio audience. All right, we know that John Tory says that he has a plan for this city, and he's hoping that the majority of Torontonians are ready to get back on board with the Tory bus for a third time. Ali Shiasan is live for us tonight at Tory's headquarters at the Fairmont Royal York. Ali, I can see some people behind you there. What is the atmosphere like? Well, Chris, things are really starting to pick up right now. Uh, we are in a room full of, you guessed it, Tory supporters, and this has kind of become a bit of a glorified watch party, if you will. This is a very confident room full of people, including members of his campaign team. For a lot of the folks here, it's not a matter of if he will be re-elected, but when the results will come in. If John Tory is re-elected for a third term, he then becomes Toronto's longest serving mayor. So there is a lot at stake here, especially if he doesn't run for a fourth time. This then would become his legacy term. It would be interesting to see how he approaches that. Are we going to hear um, some new bright ideas from the mayor or is he going to chart the course that he set for himself essentially two terms ago? Will one of his first orders of business be him turning his attention to the city's finances, digging Toronto out of debt and then seeing smart track through to completion and calling it a career from then? I feel like if I were to ask him tonight if he were to run for a fourth term, and this would be his legacy term, he would say, Ali, I got to win this one first. Don't uh, get too far ahead of yourself. And then I think if I were to ask his wife, Barbara, about that, she would go, don't give him any ideas. They were hoping to have him just as a two-term mayor. But we will have to see tonight, won't we? Send it back to you, Chris. Thank you so much, Ali, and we will definitely be touching base with you throughout the night. Of course, we're not just watching the mayoral race. We're going to be watching those ward races as well. And as I was mentioning, there are a few of them that are open because councillors, longtime councillors in some cases, have decided not to run again. Denzelman and Wong is among them from Don Valley East, first becoming a councillor in 1994. My goodness, then one of Tory's deputy uh, mayors for the past eight years. Thank you, Denzel, for being here tonight. Pleasure.
I guess the first thing I'm kind of curious <clears throat> about is everybody has their own reasons. Sometimes they're on, to go on to a different level of politics, but I'm just kind of curious. When we see so many people leaving council, leaving that job, why do you think that is? I, I think that we all have our, our reasons and all of them are different. Um, so uh, I, I think some, some councillors uh, just want to move on and do different things. Mm -hmm. That would be part of my decision. Mine, I have a lot of reasons. I, I, you found, I found out during COVID how much time I was spending away from my family. Right. Uh, because I was spending so much time with my family, that was a factor as well. Um, uh, others are seeking other career opportunities, so it's a whole mixed bag. One thing that I've heard from several Councillors and residents, voters as well, is just how slow things often move at council and that that is a chief driver of frustration for them. I'm curious, from what you've seen at council over your long time there, is that a frustration that you've dealt with, the fact that things are just so slow sometimes to go through? Government is generally slow, so you have to have a certain level of patience. You also have to understand that, you know, there are a lot of people who are impatient, but things like community consultation take time. Get, you know, the planning process takes some time. You can't, you can't circumvent involvement from the community. And also, if you're developing a community, you just don't do it overnight like that. Right. Um, you have to, there's a lot of minutia that has to be discussed. I understand the impatience for sure. But, uh, you know, they say that civic government is closest to the people. That's because we deal with detail. Can we do better? 100%, but uh, you know, things take time at City Hall. We just heard from Nama who was talking about how with the planning in particular around City Hall, there are so many times where there are resident objections that are standing in the way of smart ideas, good ideas from what she was saying. How often do you see that where there's this kind of NIMBY crowd that's jumping in and saying they don't want something and that slows down a project? Sometimes there are resident ob objections that are that are standing in the way of bad development. I've always come and started from the place where you go to the community, you ask their views, you give them the benefit of the doubt. Some of these folks come in from somewhere outside the community and they tell the community what they think they know best. Mm -hmm. And that's the wrong approach. One of the things the city needs to, I think, take a better look at is uh, having authentic consultation. We've lost that. We want to rush, rush, rush. We don't want to talk. We want to rubber stamp things and ram them through. That's not how civic government worked in the past, ever since I was on council, and I think we need to revisit it and balance out good ideas and also bad ones. One of the things that came up a lot on this campaign trail was the state of disrepair of mm -hmm. the city of Toronto. You were recently telling the Toronto Star that there's a feeling that the city doesn't care anymore due to what you called neglect. Describe for me why you feel like we're seeing this kind of decay. Well, um, I think because for a long time we haven't been investing in, in the infrastructure. Um, uh, and uh, in some places we've been cutting back. Um, be, um, how, and we haven't been looking at efficiencies. If we looked at efficiencies in the government, we, we would have, and I'm not talking about cuts, mm -hmm. two different things. We could find the money to fund more of these programs. The other thing that I think that, that people don't realize is we've been putting our eggs in specific baskets. So we've been putting them in housing and transit, which are worthwhile priorities. But when you put all your eggs in one basket, it means you're not, you're not balancing out. Like we need to spend more money on roads. We need to spend more money on fixing up our public right of ways in our parks. When you put all your money over to these things, it's a choice. It means you're not spending as much money on these other things. And, and uh, we've got to rebalance and look at those things. You started off that answer by talking about the revenue uh, that the city is bringing in. And some argue that the reason why we're seeing this neglect is because property taxes are low in Toronto, the lowest in Ontario. How much responsibility do you and other councillors who have supported keeping property taxes low, how much responsibility do you share in then having this kind of urban decay and lack of uh, services. Sure, um, I, again, I'll go back to this idea that the, this city council has been kicking down, down, kicking the can down the road in terms of looking at finding efficiencies. And uh, that's, I think that's been a funding problem. We have other really challenging funding problems and we have a, 
the economy that we have to deal with. Um, but we've got a shortfall in the land transfer tax coming up because real estate mm -hmm. is not transacting as much as we thought. I think, I think the province was down 15% in their land transfer tax. For us, that works out to $150 million. We've got some other costs coming. So for example, you know, the Eglinton Crosstown, the province paid for the capital. The operating costs are ours. So we're going to have to pay for the operating costs. And you know that we don't, we don't make all that money from the fare box. So it's, we're going to be short there. If we were to just spend the resources on fare evasion, these are people that are stealing from the TTC, we would get $70 million. But because some members of council don't want to do that, they want to actually make transit free, that $70 million could go a long way to fixing up the city. And that's $70 million every single year. Contracting out garbage, we just made that decision. $14 million that we lost. That, how many uh, splash pads could we build for $14 million? These are decisions that are being made and we have to understand the true impact of them. Okay, um, now the other thing that I've of course, a lot of people have been talking about throughout this campaign is the strong mayor powers that the next mayor of the city of Toronto is going to have. What do you think that's going to do to the dynamics at uh, City Hall? You support them? I do support uh, the strong mayor uh, uh, powers. He, uh, John Tory, if he gets elected tonight, will be the only person that was elected by all the people. And so he should, he should have uh, those extra powers. And uh, I think there's a, my fear is that if some of the races go as they might, that this will be more of a left-wing council, and we need, fisc we need folks, councillors, representatives, representatives that uh, are going to look at the finances, and I'm afraid that they're not going to want to. And so the mayor is going to have to be there to use those powers. And I would say that my guess is John Tory, uh, if he's elected tonight, which I hope that he is, will be very careful in how he uses that power uh, because I think he's been very careful over the last eight years in terms of getting along with his colleagues. So you're supportive of this idea, these strong mayor powers, given the fact that you're thinking about it in reference to John Tory potentially getting reelected tonight. But what if somebody from the left wing of the city's political scene, a Josh Matlow or a, uh, you know, Michael Layton, what if one of them are in the mayor's chair? Do you still support strong mayor powers then? 100%. Uh, I do because it allows the voters to, it, uh, it makes the mayor purely accountable for his mandate. He can't blame anybody else. People know uh, when that person runs for re-election, they'll be held accountable you can't say, oh, no, that was council's decision. That wasn't my responsibility. Right. That person is in the hot seat for what he did. Okay. And then finally, just before I let you go, I know that Councillor Cynthia Lai was a, a good friend of yours. I saw your tweet after she passed away on Friday. What would you like to say about the legacy that she leaves council and this city? Uh, Cynthia Lai was, was a really wonderful councillor. Uh, she was a, a real estate agent. Uh, uh, she was very involved in the Chinese community. Um, and uh, her legacy is one of, I think, hopefulness, um, of happiness. On, on social media, everyone had such nice things to say about her, and they were all, she has such happy pictures, and it's about how someone can work with her community, and she was very proud of her community to accomplish uh, good and great things. Very positive. All right, great. Well, thank you for those kind words, and thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Anybody gonna clap for Denzel Men and Why? There you go. <laughs> Had to work for that one. Yeah, I know. Um, okay, so we have talked a lot tonight about incumbents, and those are, of course, councillors who are running for re-election. And in case you're out there wondering, why are we talking about this so much? Why is being an incumbent coming with such an advantage? Here's a primer for you. Anyone can run in a city election with an equal shot at winning, right? Think again. More than any other level of government, municipal politics is the toughest to crack because candidates aren't part of parties. They're on their own. Unless you have a powerful endorsement, think John Tory backing then newcomer planner Brad Bradford in 2018. That's the kind of support you have to get or good luck.
More often than not, the incumbent, the person running for re-election, is the one who wins. In 2014, for example, 84% of the seats went to incumbents. Only seven of 44 seats at the time went to newcomers. And in all but one of those, it was because the sitting councilor wasn't running again. In 2018, a council slashed in half saw the power of incumbency challenging itself. 13 incumbents were tossed from office, but that was because 11 of them were duking it out against each other. That's when things get really spicy because nothing threatens an incumbent like another incumbent. So why is incumbency so powerful? First, it can deter challengers. Take this election, for example. In most wards with an incumbent running, there's only a few challengers. In wards that are open, so no incumbent is running, there's an average of 10 or 11 candidates. At its simplest, incumbency is powerful because people vote for who they know. As a reporter covering elections for years, the most common answer I get when asking voters about their intentions, he or she is the only one I've ever heard of. Plus, the rest of the establishment typically knows the incumbent. Councillors have had years to get to know their constituency. They speak with residents and business owners constantly, and they have time to develop relationships with members of parliament and provincial parliament. And with how few people actually vote in municipal elections, they're cooking up a recipe for success. Newbies also face financial crunches. Raising funds is hard without name recognition. Some say a potential fix could be having municipal political parties like there are in Vancouver and Montreal. Parties have the resources to recruit good candidates and run good campaigns. But people who are against that say bringing partisan politics into city council would be more divisive and make it even harder to get things done. Some have suggested term limits would be helpful in creating a more representative city council. Currently, they don't exist. But keeping councillors to two terms, eight years, would lead to more fresh voices. The big problem with that, the politicians who benefit from this system are the ones in charge of making changes. So why does it even matter? The triumph of incumbents makes electing new talent increasingly improbable. So that incumbent advantage leads to a real disadvantage for city democracy, a frustrating lack of diversity, diversity of thought, identity and background. And if all of this is turning people off politics, can you even blame them? I want to break in right now with a big update in our show this evening. CBC's Decision Desk has looked at the numbers and is ready to project the next mayor of Toronto. John Tory is projected to be heading back to City Hall as the first strong mayor in this city's history. The 65th mayor of Toronto, we are projecting Tory has been re-elected to his third term in office. If he stays in that seat for the full four years, he will become Toronto's longest serving mayor and that is his campaign party headquarters tonight. In 2014, Tory first won with 40% uh, support, dramatically increasing his vote share in 2018 with 63.5% support. And tonight is another great night for John Tory. Ali Shiasan is standing by live at Tory's headquarters for us. Hey there, Ali. I'm sure this was the news that many people in that room were expecting to hear. Have they started reacting yet? Oh, yes, Chris. I mean, that was fast. But I would say about 30 seconds ago, this room just became elated. Lots of woos, lots of, you know, flat handing, handshaking, all of that kind of stuff, congratulating. So the mood is definitely very high here, but Mayor John Tory isn't in the ballroom yet. You know, he's actually watching the election night results in a private room surrounded by close friends and family. And you can imagine that before he comes down and, and really, you know, figures out what kind of speech he wants to deliver, he's double checking, he is triple checking, he's quadruple sourcing those results. So right now I can tell that a few of his strategists are here as well, huddling, getting the messaging right. We will take Tory's victory speech from the podium when it happens in about 10 or 15 minutes. I'll send it back to you, Chris.
All right, Ali Shiasan, thank you for taking that close look at what happens at Tory's headquarters. We appreciate it. And of course, as Ali was saying, this campaign has been done as a front running strategy for John Tory. He often cited his steady leadership, especially through the pandemic, as he was campaigning as a major reason for people to vote him back into office. And he has a lengthy resume when it comes to politics and the corporate world as well. Farmarelli is tracking his win tonight. Hey there, Farah, what is the latest that you're seeing? Hey, Chris, so I'm tracking the numbers for us tonight. Of course, now that we have projected that John Tory will be reelected. Uh, just looking at the number of polls, we've got about 1,100 of the 1,500 polls reporting. Uh, he's got a 140,000 vote lead over Gail Penalosa right now. It's a 60% share of the votes. So the numbers speak for themselves, and they were obviously enough for our CBC News uh, projection desk to to say that John Tory will be reelected for a third term. Of course, John Tory was first elected back in 2014 in a race that was uh, against now Premier Doug Ford and Olivia Chow. Fast forward to 2018, where he was elected for a second term. And, you know, he said quite a few times that he views himself as a two-term mayor, that uh, he's somebody who wanted to spend more time with his family. Uh, so there's kind of will he, won't he up until March of this year of whether he was going to run again. Of course, that was confirmed in March. He announced he was throwing his hat back in the race, which brings us here tonight. Chris, you talked about this strong, steady leadership that John Tory campaigned on. Of course, many challenges ahead, but clearly that resonated with voters and he will have a mandate to return to City Hall for the next four years. Absolutely, Toronto's first strong mayor with a strong mandate from the people of Toronto. And I also want to break in with another important update in this election show tonight. CBC's decision desk has looked at the numbers again and we are ready to project the mayor of Mississauga. Bonnie Crombie is projected to be re-elected in the city of Mississauga. She was first elected mayor in 2014, and before that, Crombie served as the Ward 5 city councillor in Mississauga. She was also a Liberal MP for Mississauga Streetsville. She certainly, just like Tory, was the front runner throughout this campaign. She was viewed by many as someone who handled the pandemic well, and on the campaign trail made some bold suggestions again, like leaving the region of Peel. And of course, she says she is picking up after the longtime legacy of Mississauga Mayor, formerly Hazel McCallion. Okay, but now I want to come back to the city of Toronto and I want to take you to the city's northwest end now. That is where we find CBC Toronto's Dale Manukduk, who has been reporting from our Jane and Finch Community Bureau for the past two months. You have been doing some incredible reporting, Dale, showing the positive things to celebrate in that area as well as things that are not working in the neighborhood. What are people telling you as they're thinking about this election tonight? Well, Chris, as you can see behind me, there is a lot of construction happening here, and that is specifically for the Finch West LRT. And with transit infrastructure, we know that brings new condo developments and rising property values, and that is kicking up the rental prices for this low-income neighborhood, an average household income of just over $60,000. That's well below the city average of 100000 So residents are already being priced out of the community. There are frequently one-bedroom apartment units leasing out for $1,900 plus per month. And while that may sound good compared to the downtown core, it's particularly more impactful given the economic profile of the wards. So that is top of mind for residents who took advantage of early voting and people who intended to vote today. But as you'll see, not everybody wanted to talk politics. All right. What are some of the major issues affecting this community that you think might drive people to vote? Uh, right now, I think the main reason right now is rent. You're looking for people to have be able to buy food and also to um, be able to pay their rent. The same issues as ever. There's nothing really significantly different from year to year or from, from uh, election to election, is there? Housing, crime, unemployment. The housing, people are, the homeless people, they need houses, man. Can't be on the street like that all the time. If you want to, uh, you want to ask me about my sex life, I will answer that. <laughs> election. Do you plan to vote in the municipal election on Monday? Oh uh, well, I'm new here in Canada. I'm new here. Oh, you're new here. Where are you from? Uh, Nigeria. Nigeria. When did you move? On Sunday. I'm not sure you're still thinking about it, you know. No. no why not? Because I don't believe in voting. Well, 
you don't know who to vote for, right? Chris, I know you're such an incredible reporter, and so you're dying to know. I did not ask any follow-up questions about that man's sex life, but I will tell you that for everybody we spoke with that intended to vote or uh, took advantage of early voting, um, we had three or four people who said that they didn't want to talk to us or didn't intend to vote. You are such an intrepid reporter. I know you will find him and ask every question that needs to be asked. But also, you have, of course, been spending the last couple of months up in uh, that part of the city. Can you tell us a little bit more about the work that you've been doing, Dale? So we've really been focused on two things. That's affordable housing, which we touched on, and opportunities for young people. I want to bring in a guest, Sean Williams. He is the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Jane Finch Community Research Partnership, which seeks to better inform academic institutions and research studies on how to best approach the community. Now, Sean was at our Jane Finch Community Listening Session. He had a chance to interact with each of the ward's candidates face-to-face. -face. Sean, what did you take away from that interaction? I think the biggest takeaway for me was the level of communication between the candidates and community members. A lot of people assume that community members don't really know what's happening in politics and don't really want to talk on these issues, but we do. We're a very vocal community and we just want to make sure that these issues are being addressed. So I really thought that the listening session was a great way to have that little network, that little connection where we're able to come together, talk about these issues and provide you know solutions or ways we can move forward. And I know that you are particularly passionate and invested in supports for youth around here. What is missing? What do you hope from the local councillor to represent you? Definitely in terms of employment opportunities, especially for a lot of people living in the community. A lot of them are like entrepreneurs and artists. Me, consider myself as an entrepreneur. I think there needs to be more opportunities for employment, especially at the higher level, not just, you know, lower level opportunities, but something that allows people to do high level work where it's like they can do entry level. It doesn't have to require, you know, a lot of qualifications and criteria. I think that really touches a lot, especially for the younger generation. We're very eager to work and we're very eager to get out there in the workplace. So I think having those employment opportunities would be so crucial to the Jane Finch community. Well, Sean, we really appreciate your um, engagement and your participation and your perspective. But we want to turn now to, again, back to housing. We're going to bring in another guest, Wanda McNevin. She is a lifelong resident. She moved out to be spend more time with her grandkids in Pickering, but she has a lifelong um, experience of community development, community programming. She's also written three books about her experience in Jane and Finch, the last one, by us, for us, activism in Jane and Finch, a working class community. Wanda, obviously affordable housing, top of mind for everybody, but specific to Jane and Finch, it's about rentals, about tenancy. What mechanisms are in place for the city to protect legacy renters and their families? Well, I think, first of all, any development, any new development that's coming into the community um, ought to have um, a, uh, a proportion or percentage of units available for people who move into the units that's affordable housing or better yet rent geared to income and we already have that in our community um, many years ago in the chalk firm community at jane and wilson had a percentage of their units allocated for rent geared to income and across the street at san romanaway revitalized or san romanaway uh, high rise they have a percentage of units that are rent geared to income so i think if that's happened in the past why can't that happen going forward for every single unit that's built here there ought to be some affordable housing and this this community also has a lot of toronto community housing stock it has 2500 units that's over 7,000 residents there are 18 tch communities in ward 7 what is tch doing right what is it doing wrong what can be done going forward well um as far as i'm concerned i mean housing was started to be built here in the um uh, late 60s, early 70s. And the way in which they built social housing in our community really didn't work for the people who moved into those neighborhoods. So it's not the people that are the problem that live in social housing, it's how it was built. So the, the, the neighborhoods like Fir Grove, like Yorkwoods, like Edgeley Village, Driftwood, all the townhouses were built facing inwards. And so it wasn't amenable to being um, connected to the neighborhood around you. And I think as a result of that, just the neighborhoods became inward and making it very difficult. And there was no eyes on the streets. There, there were no roads going down the streets. Um, so I think that did create a big problem for our community. So there's obviously a lot of changes coming to Ward 7 specific to Jane and Finch, and it's gonna be very important who is representing the ward going forward. We'll send it back to you, Chris. Dale, thank you so much. And I want to ask the live studio audience here, are you ready for another projection?
All right, because the CBC Decision Desk has looked at the numbers again, and we are ready to project the mayor of Brampton. Patrick Brown is projected to be re-elected in the city of Brampton. He was first elected as the mayor of Brampton in 2018, and his name is very familiar to political fans right across this country because he has run as the uh, PC leader in Ontario formerly. He was then disqualified as the uh, conservative federal candidate to lead that party just in July. But Patrick Brown has been reelected by the people of Brampton, according to the CBC Decision Desk Projection. And we have Megan Fitzpatrick there at Patrick Brown's campaign headquarters. Hey there, Megan, how are people reacting tonight? This was a tight one. Well, as you might imagine, people in this room are very excited to hear those results, Chris. Uh, quite a quite a decent crowd here. They've been milling about for quite some time, uh, awaiting these results to come in. And of course, they're awaiting the arrival of Patrick Brown. He's not here in the room just yet. Uh, so we'll be watching for him to come and deliver what looks like will be his second victory speech, having been re-elected as mayor of Brampton. First elected in 2018 with 44% of the vote then. And Brown has been saying throughout this campaign that he wanted not only to win re-election, but to do it with a bigger mandate. So we'll see what the final results are um, at the end of the night. But he had been touting his accomplishments during his first term, telling voters, you know, his slogan was promises made, promises kept, uh, touting that he got funding for public transit and health care in this city, that he froze property taxes. But of course, it hasn't been a completely smooth ride for Brown at Brampton City Council. There's been quite a bit of division in recent months between councillors who align with Brown and some who don't. Um, there's been quite a few controversies. And so one of Brown's challenges will be to get city council back on track. And that will partly depend on who else is re-elected and filling those council seats at Brampton City Hall. There's someone here at the podium behind me, obviously, thanking the supporters who are here. But again, we will uh, await Patrick Brown's arrival and see what he has to tell the people of uh, Brampton who seemingly have re-elected him tonight. And Megan, as you've been talking with those supporters tonight there at Patrick Brown's headquarters, I'm curious, what have they been telling you in terms of how they're hoping that Patrick Brown is able to move forward with any sort of council there in Brampton, given everything that you were just describing Describing about how chaotic and divided it was before this election night. Well, I did speak to his campaign manager, and I put that very question to him uh, about this challenge that Brown will face uh, trying to move on from the dysfunction of the last couple of months. They partly point to the fact that a couple of councillors who were not quite aligned with Brown aren't running again. There will be some new faces at City Council, and they are in part counting on that uh, to help Brown accomplish his, his agenda. One other thing I'll mention, as we know, the province of Ontario has given these strong mayor powers to the cities of Ottawa and Toronto and promised to extend them to other municipalities in about a, a year. Patrick Brown is in favor of those powers. He'd like to have them here in this city. So perhaps that could be another way that he could get some things accomplished on his agenda that he hadn't been able to do in his first term. All right, Megan Fitzpatrick, thank you so much for that look from Patrick Brown's campaign headquarters in Brampton. But I want to bring things back to the city of Toronto. And Farah Morelli is tracking those ward races very closely. We were talking earlier about how we like surprises on an election night. And I know that you are keeping a look at what some incumbent races are looking like. Yeah, I've got a few surprises for you, Chris. We've been talking so much about uh, the uh, open wards where an incumbent isn't running. I've got a few interesting wards where the incumbents are running and are in very tight races. Let us start with Ward 3, Etobicoke Lakeshore. This is, of course, the incumbent being Mark Grimes, a close Tory ally endorsed by now Mayor John Tory. Uh, he is actually trailing Amber Morley, who has been fighting a tough campaign over the last few months. I Last check, she was ahead by 1,800 votes, with 76 of the 86 polls reporting. That is going to be an interesting one to watch. Amber Morley uh, challenging the incumbent, Mike Mark Grimes, in that in that ward. Let's head over now to Ward 5, York Southwestern. 
Every time I refresh this race, uh, it is a neck and neck race between Francis Nunziata and Chiara Padovani. Everyone knows Francis Nunziata as the longest serving counselor in Toronto. She's been around since 1988. Chiara Padovani is fighting to replace her. That race is going to go right down to the wire. It is very, very tight right now. Finally, we will head over to Ward 20, Scarborough Southwest. This is uh, with a riding where a ward where the incumbent is also another close Tory ally, Gary Crawford. Uh, at last check, he was drawing a bigger lead over Parthi Kandaval, a TDSB trustee, by a few hundred votes. That is still a close one. Uh, so, Chris, a few races where we are seeing incumbents being challenged uh, right down to the wire. We will bring you those results as they come in. All right, Farah, thank you so much for that look at the results. And we're always wondering what is driving people to go out and vote. We already talked a lot about housing earlier, but we want to talk about travel and how people are getting around this city, whether it's on two wheels or four by bus or subway. Getting around this city certainly has its challenges. And it had residents talking when I asked them about what can be done to bring some calm to what can often be a chaotic commute. Check this out. You have to wait over four hours before they can come and pick you up. No, see, um, wheel trans, they should change, they should change it. Because right, right now, it's not good for seniors. The worst would definitely be the TTC on a weekend night, you know, when you're trying to get home, you know, a couple of drinks down. I think uh, electric bikes, something, you know, that you see a lot of on okay. the footpaths, you don't need particularly a license for that. You can just drive one around. It uh, doesn't take you too fast, uh, very economical, easy to charge. How about uh, the bike lane infrastructure? How does that work for you? Well, I mean, Toronto has one of the best bike lane infrastructures in the country, I think, you know, and uh, definitely there's room for improvement. Uh, but I, as an immigrant, I really have nothing to complain about. Subway is pretty fast. We have, uh, tra we have subway every three minutes, I guess. But the buses, uh, they do tend to be delayed a lot. Uh -huh. that, that's an issue. You've been left out in the cold or the rain or something? Many times, many times. It's especially uh, <laughs> winter is around us. I usually walk because whenever I try, try to take a transit, I'm always like late for class because it gets delayed and then even the trams are like mostly delayed here so yeah i prefer walking around we had some of the audience laughing there with some of those answers i think are they resonating with you all yes. yeah we're seeing some nodding there and i got to tell you that was probably the easiest one to pull answers out of people getting them talking about transit is sure easy in this city some people were happy with how things were going but a lot of people had ideas around how transit and travel could be improved and joining me now to talk about this are two people who are big fans on seeing how people move around the city. Willem Klumpen, Klumpenhauer studies sustainable transportation and is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto's Transit Analytics Lab. Thank you for being with us. And Christopher McGarrell is uh, co-founder of a cycling club and is on the board of directors for for Cycle Toronto, thank you so much Founder. for being with us. Founder, yeah. fantastic. Founder. Well, you two are the people <laughs> to be here tonight, and I'm so glad that you're here, you're here to chat about all of this stuff. We heard from you know, some of those voters around travel and transit, what drives them crazy. Christopher, let's start with you. What are you thinking when you're hearing those kind of uh, things? What's the thing that drives you the craziest about getting around the city of Toronto? I mean, it all makes sense. I mean, I'm from, I'm from a place of privilege. I have a car. I have a bike and I have a Presto card, right? So I have the luxury of deciding, you know, what's best for me in those moments. But a lot of people don't have that luxury, right? So mm -hmm. um, a lot of people that I know personally do ride bicycles. The infrastructure could be a bit better. Um, I know a lot of people that have cars that, you know, kind of hate on me for riding a bike, but it's just changing the perception, you know, because a lot of that opinion is predicated on their personal experience. So someone who drives a car and they see a bike and they initially get annoyed, you know, they need to change their thinking and realize that that's one less car that's on the road in that moment, right? So I think it's a bit of education that comes into play there. Um, but ultimately, um, just, you know, we need to just work together and try to find some more viable solutions for everyone. Yeah, a bit of compassion for people. Hey, uh, I'm curious, what do you think? When you're looking at the, the things that are not working, what's the number one for you? Uh, I think I think you maybe hit the nail on the head about about choice there, but but also these sort of day to day frustrations that people see. Um, I think we don't necessarily do a great job of capturing that those are happening and, and really sort of communicating with riders and, and cyclists and, and even drivers that those kinds of things are happening. Um, so, you know, those day-to-day -day frustrations, you know, the gaps between 
between the subway cars or a bike lane that's closed or someone parked in a bike lane um, or construction as you, were, as you were talking about. And those are the things that sort of people build a repertoire in their head about. And that's the impressions that they get, right? Nobody remembers their best day on the TTC. People right. remember their worst day on the TTC, right? And I have quite a few, I think. For sure. That. And I think, you know, so we need to minimize those and, and we need to sort of also teach people to understand that um, you know, there are good days and, and hopefully there are many, many more good days than bad days. Okay, so Willem, a follow up for you then, because we talk about how Toronto's transit is, you know, colloquially called the better way, but for so many people, it's not working for them. So what do you think could be done? Name one thing for me that could take it and make it actually the better way and the fastest way. Right. Uh, yeah, fastest is, is probably the, the way to start. Um, we need to recognize that, you know, 50 people on a bus should should get priority over 50 people in uh, in a car or in an individual car, right? Which I sort of think of as two armchairs and a couch and a box, right? So those 50 people or the people on the streetcars, you know, they should have priority. There shouldn't be cars in their way. There shouldn't be, um, you know, these obstructions. And that would speed up transit. That would make what we have already so much better without having to, um, you know, really rely on these huge transit expansions that are that are coming, which are great too, of course. Well, and I'm curious about these big transit expansions that are coming. Um, Christopher, from your perspective, we heard from John Tory, who is now, we're projecting, been re-elected to the city of Toronto as mayor. And he really ran on this campaign saying, stay the course when it comes with transit. He touted his $28 billion transit plan that's been approved by the province and the feds. And I'm curious, as you're looking at this, this kind of stay the course campaign that he was running when it comes to transit, how does that land with you? I'm a Capricorn, I'm not really a patient guy, you know? And um, a lot of people in the city are impatient as well, especially those living on Eglinton. You know, one of our favorite patty spots is, is gone and, we're, and a lot of us are thinking it's attributed to um, the construction that impeded access to those businesses, right? right. So we've been patient, you know, even the, looking back at summer 2020 with the active TO program, you know, the data doesn't lie. A lot of people are on bikes and taking full advantage of that opportunity. And there were some promises there to like bring that back and we haven't seen anything, right? So yeah. um, definitely an opportunity for them to like demonstrate a bit of transparency or, or integrity or just like keeping their word um, and then to taking things from there. But patience is one thing, but it's when it starts to look like lies, it's kind of difficult for people to kind of take your word anymore. It's Randy's patties that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, man. In oh, people were so sad to see that one go for sure. But I'm, glad, I'm glad that you brought that up, really, because I was saying earlier with the urban planners that we had on the show, we were talking about how this city is trying to build, and in so many ways, that ends up mean, meaning a lot of construction. It's been Eglinton for years and years now. We know businesses have closed. Going forward, it's likely going to be kind of all over the city with the Ontario line. Adelaide right now closed for months in order to lay those new streetcar tracks. In the past, it was St. Clair before that. I mean, from your perspective, Willem, when you hear about all of these construction projects that so many people are on board with needing, how do we actually build transit in this city while making it livable at the same time? Yeah, and that's a very tough prospect, right? You know, any sort of big changes like this, there's going to be growing pains, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's going to happen. So, and I think people understand that construction is necessary, um, but I think it, you know, when it, when it drags on or when it's there day to day or it's so disruptive like we've seen in places like Eglinton um, that sort of turns out, uh, turns out to be a little bit, you know, it's too much, right? Or, or it wears your patience a little bit thin. Um, so I think there are things we can do to maybe simplify some of the way we do some of these projects. Uh, we have a bit of a habit to sort of over overbuild and over focus on, um, you know, lumping a whole bunch of projects together into one transit project, and that can kind of draw them out and draw out construction. So there's some ways around it. There's examples we can take from around the world that we might be able to do things a little bit more efficiently and hopefully minimize the growing pains a little bit. The other thing that is really a priority in this city is getting ridership on the TTC back up. I was looking before and TTC ridership is just around roughly 70% of pre-pandemic levels. And so Tory and pretty well all of the mayoral candidates who were talking were saying that this was a major priority for them, getting people riding the rocket again and riding streetcars again. Christopher, from your perspective, what can be done to actually get people back to transit? I don't think it's limited to just transit. When I think about transit, when I think about biking, um, the number one option right now is to make it more safe. Right. My friend and I rode the subway yesterday and we literally saw a woman get assaulted on the TTC. And we're just thinking to ourselves, you know, like there should be security on the subway walking up and down or something to, to, to add a, an element of safety or a layer of safety for people because you can't call it the better way when there's a risk that you might be putting yourself in harm's way just going to work or going to school. 
You know, that, that shouldn't be on the menu. So um, definitely some improvements there for sure. Um, but safety, I would say, say, is of utmost importance right now. Okay, so making it safe, definitely one right off the get-go. But a lot of uh, candidates have also raised this concept of making it free. And um, Willem, I'm curious from you, because you've argued in the past that fair, free transit isn't necessarily the better way. Describe for me what you're saying when you say that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so fair, free transit, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion. And I think it sort of boils down to this principle that, you know, me, I can afford to pay for transit. I should pay for transit. I'm getting something out of it. Um, and, and so I don't necessarily think that, you know, going with a zero fare policy is, is necessarily the right way to go. And, and the big part of that is you lose a lot of that revenue, uh, you know, revenue income. We talked, we heard uh, Councillor Min and Wong talk about the fare box recovery. Um, but I don't think that if, if the cost of the subway is a barrier to you, that, that you should have to pay. So there are mechanisms to, to deal with that. Um, and I guess the other question is, sort of, you know, if you take the money you're going to spend on free transit, and you instead take that money and you spend it on making the service better, more frequent, um, more reliable, Safe. safer. Um, right. You know, are you going to get? You, you generally tend to see that you get more ridership out of that dollar for dollar than you would necessarily do by just eliminating fares entirely. So, okay, yeah. good point. Interesting thought. Uh, I want to switch over to bike infrastructure and bike lanes. Somebody laughed when that guy off the top was talking about how the bike lanes that we have in Toronto are, I think he said, the best in the country. <laughs> Christopher, as our resident cyclist on the panel yeah. tonight, what are your thoughts when you uh, think of Toronto's bike lane infrastructure and how it stacks up to other jurisdictions in Canada and around the world? It's funny you mention other parts of Canada. I was in BC maybe three, four weeks ago and beautiful design beautiful, separated from the street. There's no way that cars can interfere with the cyclists. And even when I think back to, you know, years back, I traveled to Amsterdam and it's just, it's just beautifully designed and it encourages people to consider cycling as a viable option. Um, here in, in Toronto, I would say it's pretty sus, to be honest with you. It's not, you know, like, you know, there's definitely an opportunity to make it better. And I'm a Scarborough guy. I live in Etobicoke right now and I have friends that live in Rexdale, that live on the Jane. And, you know, there's lots of, it's not connected. You know, so as much as there, there's a budget and they're putting money up to, you know, lay down more cycle tracks or, you know, make more bike lanes or paint some whatever on the ground, you know, Scarborough's still limited. Scarborough's the largest piece of the, of the six boroughs and probably has the least amount of infrastructure. I currently live in Etobicoke in Six Points and they laid down some cycle tracks in my area, but it doesn't connect to anything, mm -hmm. right? So there's literally a, a, a cycle track that ends and goes right into the street. Yeah. You know, so there's definitely an opportunity to, like you mentioned earlier, to leverage some of the experience that we've seen in other parts of the world yeah. and, and recognize what works and then apply that here. Like, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Well, and I'm also... <laughs> Get some applause yeah, for that yeah, answer. Yeah. Nicely <laughs> done, Christopher. Cool. Hey, before we move on from cycling, just one final thought, because we're often talking about, you know, this dichotomy, drivers versus cyclists, and you want them to look at this with more compassion. But one thing from the driver's perspective a lot of times is when you're building cycling tracks, you're taking away a lane of traffic, mm -hmm. you're taking away parking in some cases. What's your argument to a driver that's complaining about that piece and how it made, makes more congestion and more gridlock? I think that goes back to the points that Willem and I just made. It's not so much that they're making and adding uh, cycling infrastructure, but it's how they're doing it. They're not doing it the best way. There's better ways that are proven that work. We haven't been applying them, so I can understand that. Um, but even if you look at um, some of the, you know, there's aggressive cyclists, there's aggressive drivers, you know, that shouldn't define the whole group. You know, and I think that's one thing when people see one, one you know, cyclist or an Uber Eats e-bike person, you know, weaving through traffic, all these damn cyclists. But, you know, there's a lot of people that that's their primary mode of transportation. You know, they don't have the privilege to, you know, make a car note payment or to even afford a Metro Pass every month. The bike is, you know, the, the cheapest and the most effective way for them to get around. So how the infrastructure is designed is one thing and then how it's applied is a whole different conversation. All right, final thought from both of you. Like I was saying to the urban planners earlier, let's leave on a bit of a positive note. Name one thing that we are kicking butt with in the city of Toronto. You go first. Willem, we'll start with you. <laughs> uh, I think we've got a, a wonderful example of what a lot of the city should look like in the waterfront. We've got this sort of layers of walking, cycling, streetcar, traffic. Everybody's you know interconnected. 
There's a reasonable speed for the amount of people that are there. Um, yeah, there's some confusions around signage, but I think we can look to the waterfront as a great example of, of sort of that mixed mode infrastructure. And it looked great in that opening it drone sure did. shot. Yeah, Am it I right? Just been you, but yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Hey, Christopher, what do you think? What's the one thing that you would brag to other cities about Toronto? I think it's a culmination of things. I would say our diversity for sure. You know, when you look at the makeup of our city, all the different cultures, all the different food options. We have the most beautiful women. You know, so I think it's a combination of all of those things that just make Toronto elite. Even with Randy's patties gone? I mean, there's other patties, but, <laughs> you know, Randy's just such an iconic piece of our, of our culture um, that we lost. And I think that's, you know, when, we, when you're talking about these projects, you know, we shouldn't lose pieces of, you know, what we are to become where we want to be, you know? That's such a great point. Okay, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Willem and Christopher, I appreciate your time you. so much. All right, I want to get back to some results with Farah. Hey there, Farah. I know you're watching some incumbents and some open races. What results do you want to focus on right now? Yeah, I want to go back, Chris, to some of these open races that we promised we'd be following very closely because we have some really interesting developments. I want to start over at Ward 11 University, Rosedale. We predicted this was going to be a tight three-way race. I can now tell you that it remains a tight race between uh, Norm Di Pasquale, who has 36% of the vote, uh, along with Diane Sachs. I see behind me, we actually have uh, a board for Francis Nunziata and Chiara Padovani. That is, of course, for York Southwest, and I can tell you that remains a dead heat as well. We keep refreshing uh, the page for the update. That is a neck-and-neck -neck race that we're going to be following as well. Um, I want to pull up Ward 9 Davenport. That is another uh, rate that is another race that we are watching very closely. Um, I can tell you now that Alejandro Brava has a commanding lead with about 70% of the vote. Remember, she is somebody who has run in many municipal elections. She actually ran federally uh, in the 2021 election for the NDP. And get this, she lost by 76 votes. She came back fighting with this campaign is now poised to be the new councillor for Davenport. Finally, I want to take you to Scarborough North, uh, of course, uh, a ward that we've been talking about a lot on, on the show and in recent days because it was the ward of incumbent Cynthia, Cynthia Lai, who sadly passed away last week. Uh, because of how close that her death was to the election, her name remained on the ballot. However, any votes for her are not being counted, and that's being reflected on the city's website tonight. They're not even including the numbers for the votes that she has. And so at this hour, we can tell you that Jamal Myers is poised to uh, take that riding, he or that, that ward with 36 of 38 polls reporting. He is leading and will be likely the new councillor for Ward 23, Scarborough North. Uh, Many more races that we are watching, Chris, just a few to update you on because I know so many people have been interested in these open wards. All right, Farah, thank you. You covered a lot of ground there. We appreciate it. And of course, we're also talking about a lot of the issues that matter to people. We talked transit, we talked housing. Now we want to kind of focus in on that urban decay that so many of us are talking about around the city. Garbage bins that are full or broken, rutted roads, crumbling sidewalks and pathways. It seems like wherever you go in the city, something might be broken. Outgoing uh, Deputy Mayor Denzel Min and Wong touched on this a little earlier tonight, but I was out asking residents if Toronto is looking a little worse for wear these days. Here's what some people had to say. The garbage thing, that's that's not so good. Why not? What do you uh, see? Well, I mean, there's times of where, I mean, they know the amount of people passing by, that they should have it picked up more regularly, where people are putting things on top and around because it's just overflowing. But more public restrooms, but overall the city looks very clean. Um, there are parts, you know, but hey, some people are working through some, some things, that's fine. The way the facilities are kept, for example, the bus stops and everything, like it's in a really bad shape and the hygiene levels are like not kept up to date and also the garbages are like not picked up regularly. I think that we have to pay taxes, it's a fact of life and if, uh, if we can see the, that the um, political leaders have a plan for where those taxes are going and we can see the improvements. I think that they sh and they have a solid plan. We should, I think we would be paying more taxes. I think they should increase the taxes with the rate of inflation a little bit more. The city's broken down amenities are the focus of a new satirical public art project called Asterity T.O. And I had the chance to speak with the creators about bringing attention to the state of the city. So we're standing in front of Urinal, 
uh, which is a reference to Marcel Duchamp <laughs> and his piece, which was entitled Fountain, which is a urinal. Uh -huh. uh, and this is a water fountain that has been rendered inoperable uh, by way of lack of maintenance and has now been turned into sculpture. Is the cheekiness part of why you think it's so effective? I think so. I think we're trying to get people to look at their city satirically mm -hmm. as opposed to being disappointed by this sort of thing. So the city responded to your public art project saying that generally speaking the city is in a very good state of repair and saying that complaints to 311 for example have not increased recently. What do you say to that? Well, what I would say to that is that we're standing literally right beside City Hall in Nathan Phillips Square, and this water fountain is so thoroughly broken that I can put my hand through it. Right. And it just, look around. I, I mean, the city can say what they want to say, but everybody can see the garbage cans overflowing. Everybody can see the state of disrepair in the city. It is endemic. And I was late getting here because of transit. You were late getting here because of traffic. I mean, there's almost this shorthand that Torontonians have with each other that everybody is probably going to be 10 or 15 minutes late. Your art project calls out issues like transit and that sort of thing as well. Tell me why. Well, I, I think it all sort of feeds into what's been going on in the city in the last 10 years or so, where the services have not been maintained. Whether it's the roads, whether it's the bike lanes, whether it's the transit system, public amenities, or more serious services like homelessness, like community programs, like housing, all of it is crumbling under a lack of maintenance and it's coming apart at the seams. Does it feel like anyone has a plan for how to deal with the issues that you're speaking about now and also a plan for what this city is gonna look like in the future with all the growth that we're getting? I think you have seen mayoral candidates uh, come out with plans. Specifically, I've seen Gil Penalosa kind of pushing an idea of vision. We're not endorsing anyone as part of this campaign, uh, but we want to kind of help people imagine a reality where John Tory does have a vision for the city. When the next council takes its seat, the next council and mayor, what is the one thing, if you could boil it down to one thing, that you would like to see from them? Well, I, what I would like to see is the citizens of Toronto really look at the city and say, we are living in the artwork of John Tory as mayor and the city council as the people who are running the city. This is their work. And hold people responsible for that. Don't be satisfied and just say, that's the way it is. Uh, I, this is this is what's happening. It's happening because of choices that are made in City Hall. and. The councillors, the mayor, and the citizens need to embrace that attitude. They are responsible. So you heard there, those creators were not necessarily endorsing any candidates, but they certainly were targeting that campaign directly at John Tory. And since we are projecting that he has been re-elected tonight, I want to take you back to John Tory's campaign headquarters with Ali Shiasan. She is standing by live with one of the people that helped John Tory get re-elected. Hey there, Ali. Hey, Chris, that's right. So here I am with Janessa Crognelli from Team Tory's re-election campaign team. You guys must be feeling pretty good tonight. How, how's it going? It's, we feel great. You know, these municipal campaigns are a marathon and not a sprint. And so we're really proud of the campaign that we ran and our ability to reach voters. And so we're just thrilled with the results. Now, what have those voters been telling your team uh, as you get to the door, uh, door knocking and chatting with them about what they want to see for Toronto? What are they telling you? Yeah, I think the number one issue for voters is affordability and transit and housing. And so these are all things that the mayor has talked a lot about on his campaign. And these are all part of the platform ideas that he's put forward. And so uh, I think voters really connected with those ideas and we're seeing the results of that tonight. So this could become, if he doesn't run a fourth term, I don't want to get too <laughs> far ahead of ourselves, but okay, let's. Let's say this becomes his legacy term as mayor. How is he going to approach that? So I think for the mayor, it's all about building on the progress that he's made over the past eight years, as well as introducing new ideas. So in terms of progress, um, you know, he led the city through the pandemic and into economic recovery. So building on top of that, he secured a $28 billion plus transit expansion plan for the city. And so that's something that he wants to keep on track. And as well as new ideas that he put forward during the campaign, like his five point housing plan to build more homes in the city faster, something that we really need. So I think you're going to see a combination of those things all underpinned by his ability and desire to work collaboratively with both levels of government to get big things done and get the best deal for the city. So I know that a lot of people have, you know, expected this result. 
Um, but I'm sure there's a little bit of a sigh of relief with any campaign um, announcement. Can you tell me about, you know, sort of the work that led up to this moment and, um, you know, maybe the, the pivot that you guys have to do to getting this third term underway? Yeah, of course. So, you know, we certainly haven't taken anything for granted. Um, the mayor has never taken for granted the support that he enjoys from Torontonians. And so that's why he was out almost every single day speaking with Torontonians during the campaign. Uh, I think he knocked on over a thousand or so doors during the campaign. That's why he put forward an extensive campaign platform outlining his vision for the city. And so we certainly didn't take our foot off the gas pedal. And now the mayor, I know, is ready to get back to work and make those big things happen. And you work with him very closely. I'm wondering if you can give us any insight into some of his first orders of business. So the mayor is certainly ready to hit the ground running. I think you heard him talk a lot during the campaign about his priority areas, which are keeping transit on track, building more housing, especially affordable and supportive housing, and uh, focusing on economic recovery. And so those are all things that he'll be focused on day one when he's back to the job. But immediately probably popping a champagne bottle and celebrating with family. <laughs> Maybe a drink or two will be involved, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Send it back to you, Chris. We are going to hear from the newly re-elected mayor himself shortly, probably in a few, few minutes, in you'd a few say. Minutes, yeah, yeah. Okay, keep it locked on that podium. Send it back to you. All right, Ali, sounds good. And I think people would understand if uh, John Tory was popping a little champagne right now with uh, the fact that he is heading back to City Hall with another strong mandate. And, of course, he will be the first strong mayor of the city of Toronto. New powers just given out by the province of Ontario to Toronto and, and uh, Ottawa as well. And if you're at home or wherever you are, here in the live studio audience perhaps, and you're kind of nodding along with this concept of a strong mayor but don't really know what it means, here's another primer for you on what those powers mean and how they'll work. Premier Doug Ford surprised a lot of people when he said he would give Toronto and Ottawa so-called strong mayor powers. Then he said he would expand it to other municipalities in a year. So when you get uh, elected as mayor, it means something. But what exactly is a strong mayor and how will it change how things are done right now? Mainly, the mayors will have a veto power over bylaws that conflict with provincial priorities like building housing. Premier Ford said it's meant as a tool to cut through the bureaucracy and the not in my backyard crowd. Strong mayors will also prepare and table their city's budget instead of council. They'll also be able to appoint and remove department heads, except for police, fire, and the auditor general. So why are these powers even needed? The Minister of Housing and Municipal Affairs says it's because some cities are in desperate need of housing and this will help. Our government needs to support efficient local decision making to speed up development timelines. But it's unclear how often these powers will be used or to what extent they could help mayors build more housing. Building the budget could help secure funding and staffing and Toronto's mayor John Tory has been in support of this but previous Toronto mayors not so much. Clearly they're trying to weaken the council and undermine those principles, which is why it needs to be resisted. If I think back to my time on, on council, there are some votes I lost that I really wished uh, I had won. And uh, if I'd had, had a veto, it would have, might have been tempting uh, to use it, but I'm not sure that would have been beneficial for council. I think you should consider uh, a very uh, aggressive program of watchfulness on the use of this legislation. Otherwise, it can be very detrimental to the ability of city council, the citizens of this city, to be able to control their future. Those former mayors say council's first order of business should be debating those powers because for Toronto and Ottawa, they kick in shortly after the election. But who will make up council? That is what we have Farah Morelli standing by for. She is tracking these close races. Hey there, Farah, what are you noticing? 
Hey, Chris, I want to go back to some of the open races before I was telling you about some of the close open races. Um, we still have a few close ones, but some where the results are looking a little bit more apparent. I want to start over in Willowdale, Ward 18. We talked about this riding earlier as it projected to be a tight race. Uh, John Fillion's old uh, ward where he is no longer running. Uh, I can now tell you that Lily Chang is edging ahead of Marcus O'Brien uh, Fair. He is, of course, John Fillion's former chief of staff uh, who ran in 2018 before uh, the provincial government government cut the wards in half. Lily Chang ran as well in 2018 and came second. And of course, uh, right now, we can now tell you that she's ahead by about 1,400 votes with 55 of the 69 polls reporting. I want to take you now to Etobicoke North. This is a ward that we've been talking about quite a bit. This is a ward that for the first time in more than 20 years does not have a Ford on the ballot. Uh, we can tell you Vince Crisanti is now taking a commanding lead with 40% uh, of the vote. Uh, he, with 51 of the 55 polls reporting, uh, he's leading, uh, he's got a significant lead ahead of Avtar Minhas. So Vince Crisanti, former city councillor, we can see that he is edging closer to going back to city councillor for the ward of Etobicoke North. Finally, I want to take you to Toronto Centre. This was a ward that was held by Kristen Wong Tam for many years. She, of course, ran for uh, the to be a provincial NPP for the NDP um, uh, in the June election just a few months ago. Uh, this is a race that had a few big names in it, but I can tell you that Chris Moyce has now taken a commanding lead. He is the Toronto District School Board trustee uh, since 2016. He has been uh, campaigning quite hard in Toronto Center. Uh, he is leading uh, social a head of social justice activist Nikki Ward, uh, who has campaigned in many races, both municipally and federally. But of course, Chris Moyce now edging ahead uh, in the riding of Toronto Center. Uh, more results coming in. It looks like some of the polls are almost all reported, Chris, so we should have some more results for you shortly. You were talking earlier in the uh, night about how there were some cities around uh, the city of Toronto who are having issues with their uh, polls coming together and, and seeing results from them. Can you recap what uh, some of those issues were? Yeah, so starting with Vaughan, we knew that uh, because of a technical issue, that's what the city was calling it, the polls there are still open. Uh, some of them open till 9, some of them open till 10. So we're probably going to be expecting those results uh, to be trickling in a little bit later. We also can confirm that there have been issues in Hamilton. Uh, what happened there, the city is telling us, is that some of the polls actually open later. So they're staying open a little bit later to make up for that lost time. Not sure what happened there, but Hamilton is having some delays. So we we haven't bringing you many results in those cities yet, although the polls are closed in many places in those cities, but unfortunately some of the polls are still open and that's why uh, we haven't been bringing you many of those results, but uh, we are tracking them, Chris. All right, Farah, important contacts. Thanks for all of that. Appreciate it. And now I want to head upstairs to the newsroom where we have Sean Jeffords, our municipal affairs reporter, standing by. Hey there, Sean. Hey, Chris. What is jumping out to you tonight? You know, some really big upsets, it seems, are in the making here. Amber Morley, it looks like she is going to potentially beat incumbent Mark Grimes in Etobicoke Lakeshore. Very close race in York Southwestern, where Kiara Padovani uh, looks like she is neck and neck with uh, Francis Nunziata, who is an incumbent who's served uh, for a long time in that ward. You know, those are two that really uh, stand out to me. There was also an incredibly close race in University of Rosedale, where Diane Sachs, the former environmental commissioner, and Norm De Pasquale, a school board trustee, are, it, frankly, it seems like every poll that reports, they are swinging back and forth, one taking the lead, then the other jumping back into it. I want to jump back uh, to Mark Grimes and to Francis Nunziata because you were talking about them off the top there. We know, of course, these are Tory allies that Progress Toronto had really been targeting, saying we're leading to problems around town. So I'm wondering, we see John Tory projected to get reelected to the to the mayor's job in the city of Toronto, but some of these councillors that he really supported and were kind of on his ticket, some might say, are having a rough night. What do you make of that and how that's going to play out in council, even if John Tory is a so-called strong mayor? You know what, Chris? I think the way the mayor looks at this is he wants to still be able to build coalitions on council. And without Grimes and without Nunziata, those are two numbers right there for him that, frankly, he's going to have to try to find somewhere else. He's going to have to build coalitions and he's going to have to try to build bridges with people that are newly elected to council. And we'll see if he's able to do it. You know, he, the temptation, frankly, to go to the strong mayor powers 
it might be there. It might be strong, you know. So losing Mark Grimes, losing Francis Nunziata, if that is how the final vote comes down, um, it, it could be a blow to the mayor. I'm also curious, we're in this group chat, Sean and I, and some of the other uh, reporters and hosts who are going to be tracking this election tonight. We're in a group chat, and one of the things that you put in there earlier on tonight was that Parkdale High Park is in kind of a tight three-way race. That's Gord Perks' spot. He's been there yeah. for four terms. I'm very curious about what you're seeing now with that race. You know, Perks has been in the lead throughout the night, but I think what we've seen there are two other candidates, uh, Chami Lamo and Syria Grell, who have mounted very, very vigorous campaigns, and that's paid off. They've had strong showings, and they're pushing Perks. Now, it, it's uh, possible that Perks may well walk away with that, but it's been a much closer race than perhaps I thought going in. All right, sounds good. And as you're uh, looking for all of these results tonight, I'm sure you are in need of a nap or something. Do you have plans for tomorrow, my friend? I hope it's not going to be a big day for you. Join me on Metro Morning tomorrow at 6 a.m. I'm going to be up bright and early looking at the results. Okay, Chris? My goodness, what a fantastic plug. I will absolutely listen in. And now I want to take our audience live to John Tory's headquarters where the I new mayor I is speaking. I Let's I listen. Thought maybe I should bring back my ponytail from the pandemic. I was watching uh, TV upstairs and uh, they were saying that what, is, what are candidates doing when they're uh, watching the results and they said they think they're freaking out. I want it on the record clearly that I was not freaking out while I was watching the results. I denied that but I was pacing around. But I'm glad to be here and I want to say tonight thank you everyone who's here and thank you Toronto. I am deeply grateful for the faith and the trust that you've chosen to put in me uh, once again to lead our city for four more years. I've delivered a number of these speeches on election nights, and you know, some of them were good, and some of them, to be candid, weren't so good. But tonight is a great night as we look ahead to a third term, a third term at City Hall with a strong mandate from the people of the City of Toronto. I want to begin by saying thank you to all the people, all of the people, because there were lots of them who put their names on ballots in this election. It's a courageous thing to do. And I want to, of course, congratulate those who've won seats on City Council. I look, I look forward to working with all of them. And I'm hugely hopeful about the future of this city. But there are challenges in front of us, and we have to meet those challenges together. And I'm looking forward. I, I've said many times during the campaign, I want to work with anybody who wants to work with me. And I look forward to working with all of the elected members of City Council as we work together to make a great city better. I want to... Yeah. I want to thank... And my family, I want to thank the campaign team, I want to thank the volunteers and everyone who supported me throughout the campaign and over the last eight years as mayor. While we have a lot to celebrate tonight as a team and as a city, I requested that tonight should be lower key in keeping with these challenging times and should be about you, the people who made this happen for the city and for me uh, in this great democratic exercise we've just been through. And so I begin with a big and sincere thank you to my co-chairs, Anna Bailao, our deputy mayor who's retiring from politics for now, uh, Deb Hutton and Zubair Patel, who have also been co-chairs of the campaign, and of course, Patrick Harris, who did a superb uh, professional uh, job as uh, campaign manager and the entire campaign team, many of whom are here in this room. All of you, I give you my most sincere thanks. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your professionalism, for your amazing hard work, and above all, for your friendship. Because together, what we did is not that usual in this day and age. We ran a positive, responsible, honest campaign, one that goes against the prevailing negative, divisive trend. And I am very thankful for that because that's the kind of campaign that I wanted to run. Talking about we're, what we're going to do and some of our ideas, uh, and doing it in a positive way, positive about the ideas and positive about the future of this city. Serving, serving as your mayor in this great city continues to be the honor of a lifetime. I love our city and I love working for the people of this city. That's why I ran for re-election in the first place. We've come so far over the past eight years, but we have unfinished business that I'm absolutely determined to see through. We've made so much progress on getting transit and housing built and growing our economy. And now we have a strong mandate to continue with that progress. And that is what I asked for, a strong mandate, and that is what I have been given. We're going to work with the provincial and federal governments to keep getting the big things done. We're going to get housing built, much more housing and much more affordable and supportive housing in many more places across our city. 
We're going to get the $28 billion transit plan built, the Scarborough subway, the Ontario line, the Eglinton Crosstown West, the Young Street North extension, and I am determined to make sure that the Eglinton East Scarborough LRT and the waterfront transit lines will be moving forward as well during this term of office. We are going to do everything we can to keep our city affordable for the residents who live here and for those who want to live here. We're going to do everything we can to keep our city safe and to support the police as they continue to modernize and keep us safe. We're going to do all we can to support all of the community organizations who work to help the people who need the help the most, including those experiencing homelessness. We're going to make sure that City Hall is focused on the nuts and bolts services. That all right, well, John Tory may have been pacing earlier in the evening. He admitted that in that speech, but he says that he has a strong mandate. And of course, the 65th mayor of Toronto is now going to be the first to be the strong mayor in Toronto's history. He says he wants, though, to work with anyone who is willing to work with him. And he pointed out that this is not usual to have three terms in the city of Toronto. His uh, his re-election back to the mayor's chair is historic. In fact, if he sits for all four years, he will be the longest serving mayor in the city of Toronto. And he applauded his own positive and optimistic campaign. And we are winding things down here at the Broadcast Centre. I'm a pretty optimistic guy myself. So as we head towards the end of the program, let's reflect on some of the things that make this city so incredible. Farah, first word to you, my friend. Name one thing. What do you love about Toronto? You know, Chris, you guys were talking about patties earlier. Randy's uh -huh. patties, got a little hungry. <laughs> I'm going to go with food, the basketball team, and of course, the people. I love that. And, and our buddy Dwight Drummond always used to bring us those patties I from know. Randy's. That Once was how I first learned of those delicious patties. Okay, some good ideas there from Farah. For me, it's got to be the beaches from Woodbine to Cherry to Humber Bay. So many fantastic spots to enjoy. Those are our favorite things about the city of Toronto. Here's what some people had to say around town. What's the number one thing that you find works about Toronto that you're happy with? Um, well, I like the fact that it's even become more multicultural. Food, man, definitely. Uh, authentic food. You get better Indian here than you do back in India. <laughs> That's true. I love that. I yeah. love it. I like Toronto because it just, I feel like it has everything we need. Like, what else do we need? I don't know. It has everything we have. How about this road behind you? Is that, is that great? It's temporary. Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not going to be there for long, so it's all good. You are optimistic. Oh, how much THC you guys put in your edibles? Way couple, too low. You've had a couple of rough nights? Well, oh. not oh, rough no. enough is the problem. <laughs> well, everyone is friendly. Everyone, you just need to ask anything. Everyone is quite friendly. That's the best thing about Toronto. So much to be excited about and so many fantastic ideas for how to make this city better. Thank you to all of the panelists who made this show what it was tonight. I appreciate you being here. And thank you also to our rock star team of journalists, Farah Morelli here in studio with me, Sean making it all make sense, Ali, Dale, and Megan for bringing us the vibe in the field. And thank you to Ramna Shazad and our stellar team behind the scenes who made all of this possible tonight. Thank you as well to our studio audience here for joining us live tonight. And thank you wherever you're watching us, whether it be at home, in your car, wherever it is, for streaming us live. We appreciate you making CBC Toronto your election night choice. We have much more election coverage throughout the evening. CBC.ca slash Toronto is your destination for up to the minute race information. And there's still some tight ones tonight. We've got a full recap coming your way of tonight's election on CBC television at 11 o'clock with Kelda Yoon. I am Chris Glover. It has been a dream to get to be here with you tonight during this live special. And I hope everybody has a great night.